and then I realized that some, all the people I knew were dead now. For 365 days, they grieved. Really sad. I don't know what this world's coming to. They tried to heal. God, I pray that you would add strength, that your grace, your love, and your mercy, Lord, would shine over the city and call for change. And I don't know what we have to do to ensure that our babies are safe. I shouldn't have to be here speaking. I'm only 10 years old, but I am because my friends have no voice no more. 19 children and two teachers died in Uvalde. Tonight, the painful reality. She's hard. It's really, really hard to live without them. Running. 18 days ago, it happened again. Out of nowhere, heard about like 10 pops go off. I mean, it was just crazy. People crying, little kids. Eight people were killed in Allen, including more children. We revisit a conversation we've been having for years. This is insane. This will never happen again. I never thought it would happen again. And we ask, when will it stop? Staying with us, I'm Cynthia Seguirre. And I'm Chris Lawrence. You know, we, we thought tonight would be all about Uvalde, but we couldn't even reach the one-year anniversary without suffering another mass shooting. May will forever be a month that we remember these faces, 19 students and two teachers in Uvalde. And fresh on our minds, these eight people who were shot and killed at the Allen Premium Outlets almost three weeks ago, the youngest victim, just three years old. In the next 30 minutes, we'll look at what school districts are doing to protect our kids. But this conversation has to start with what happened in Uvalde on May 24th last year and where the investigation stands. Parents are still demanding officials be held accountable. And as senior crime and justice reporter Rebecca Lopez reports, they want answers. <laughs> Time can be cruel. Families in Uvalde know this firsthand. They've had 365 days to pour over 77 minutes that changed their lives forever. May 24th, 2022, 11.28 a.m. Surveillance footage captures a man crash his truck into a ravine near Robb Elementary. Oh my God, they're running. I don't know why. Oh my God, he's about to die. He runs towards Robb Elementary, firing his weapon. Teacher Amy Marine, who was standing outside, saw what was happening. She runs inside, shuts a door that has been propped open with a rock, and calls 911. The door Amy shut should have locked automatically. It didn't. The gunman runs through that door seconds later and into classrooms 111 and 112. Surveillance and body camera footage shows officers arrived within two minutes. Investigators say during that time, the shooter fired off more than 100 rounds with his AR-15 rifle. Oh, shots fired! Get inside! Two sets of officers arrive and enter the building from different directions. School District Police Chief Pete Arredondo also enters the school. The gunman then shoots at officers. Two of them are grazed by bullets in retreat. Investigators found none of them shot back or attempted to take the shooter down. Experts say that was the first major failure. The head of DPS agrees. His troopers were there too. Clearly, the, the failure right at the beginning was the, the, the inability of the officers on the scene to continue to engage the subject till he was neutralized, period. More officers arrive from various agencies, including Border Patrol and DPS. Still no one confronts the shooter. According to the school police policy, Chief Arredondo was supposed to be the man in charge. He said he treated the situation like a standoff instead of an active shooter situation. While they waited, a little girl caused 911 pleading for help. I'm sorry, there's a lot of dead bodies. Body camera footage shows the acting police chief for the Uvalde Police Department, Lieutenant Mariano Pargas, was told about the little girl's 911 call. Still, they waited. I don't know how to see all these situations. My dad taught me when I was a little girl. And help from my teachers are still alive, but they're shot. More valuable time wasted searching for a key to unlock the classroom door that was later determined to be unlocked. No one perform the basic function that's needed in an incident such as this to take command and control over the situation. 47 minutes after the little girl called 911, a Border Patrol tactical team 
finally enters the classrooms and kills the shooter. Subject down, subject down. 77 minutes for law enforcement to end the threat. 77 minutes with hundreds of officers waiting in the hallway. Initially, Governor Greg Abbott and McCraw praised the actions of the officers. They showed amazing courage by running toward gunfire for the singular purpose of trying to save lives. The governor later walked back that statement saying he'd been misled. Since the shooting, Chief Arredondo continues to defend his actions, saying he wasn't in command and thought it was no longer an active shooter situation. Eventually, the school board fired him and disbanded the district's police department. The acting Uvalde Police Chief Lieutenant Pargas has resigned but was re-elected to the Uvalde County Commissioner's Court. Meanwhile, the clock keeps ticking for the families, 365 days waiting for the district attorney's office to present its investigation into law enforcement failures to a grand jury for possible criminal charges. Consequences of police, police inaction at the scene, that is really, you know, the whole point of the investigation and that would be a part of what's presented to the grand jury. Of all the 376 members of law enforcement from 23 agencies involved, only one responding state trooper was fired, another resigned, and a third is appealing his firing. The actions of every officer that day are still being investigated, but it could be months before the public knows if anyone will be held accountable. In the wake of that shooting, there were calls for tighter gun restrictions, an important aspect we will get to in a moment. But first, the changes that took effect immediately. Governor Abbott ordered every school in Texas to check its external points of entry. Those checks started in September, and auditors checked 2,800 campuses over the next four months. They weren't able to gain unauthorized access to the campus in 95% of the cases, but in the rare instances they did, it usually took a minute and involved the secondary door. It is a scary reminder this could happen at any school, but the people of Uvalde aren't dealing with a hypothetical case. As Tiffany Liu reports, they're left with the very real memory of 19 children and two teachers who never came home from school. It's been one year since Jackson Cross stepped into Robb Elementary School, now emptied. Eventually to be demolished and rebuilt. He was three classes down from my class. 11-year-old Jackson remembers inside. I know what his classroom looks like. Every time I'd walk by, i look in there, see if he's okay, and then keep walking. Do it every time, every time, back and forwards. He remembers where Uzziah Garcia went to class every day. He remembers the room where his brother took his last breath. What was that moment like for you, Jackson? It was hell. Jackson is not okay. That was the last time I saw him getting on the bus. I walked away thinking he would just come back. Jackson did not go to school the day of the mass shooting, and it's weighed on him ever since. <sighs> it's just I always wanted to play with Uzi on it. He wishes for more memories with Uzziah. More than anything. Like, more than infinity times infinity. Like. He's forced to create memories without. Jackson now attends Flora's Elementary School, but there is so much hesitation. I was just really scared and paranoid that we were gonna have like a lockdown. His dad. Oh, it's it's terrifying still. Brett Cross is scared too. You hear cop sirens and everything like that. It, it's scary. Since the massacre, Texas DPS has parked outside of Uvalde's schools as a layer of protection. But even then, it is not enough to ease the fear of Uzziah's family. <sighs> Like, I'm, I'm thankful, but at the same time is why aren't we doing something to prevent this? Like, why do we need these officers there? Why are we having to make our children go, go to essentially prisons for school that are gates and guards and everything like that? Jackson goes home from school each night to a bedroom he once shared with his brother. I mean, you, you still have all of his pictures hanging up. Yeah. 
I'm not taking those down ever. Uzziah's drawings are taped on a door he once walked through thousands of times. Actually, he never got to finish these two. He was still working on them. Facing like this. Uzziah's bed is gone. And the room is rearranged, filled with so many things, but somehow it still feels... Empty. 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 It's been one year. She's hard. It's really, really hard to live without him. For Jackson, time cannot heal this wound. In Uvalde, I'm Tiffany Liu. The kind of uh, deep trauma that these people have been through, it can't be solved simply by saying, you know, we're going to pray for you or keep you in your prayers. Uh, they, they need trained professionals who can create a, a, an individual treatment plan and, and one that may, that may have to go on for years. These shootings have a tremendous impact on our children, even if they aren't directly involved. Yeah, we, we learned of, of children in Collin County going to see a counselor after what happened in Allen. In fact, those who live near the outlet mall actually came up with their own strategy in case it happened again. We also spoke with students who wrote letters to state legislators. That tragedy in Allen on May 6th marked the first time a mass shooting happened while the Texas legislature was in session. Senior political reporter Jason Whiteley has been live in Austin all week. So well, where does all this gun reform legislation stand? Uh, Chris and Cynthia, tonight Texas lawmakers are paying tribute to what happened in Uvalde, but they have not passed anything substantial that would prevent another school shooting. Still, it was an emotional scene on the floor of the state Senate today. Lawmakers read each victim's name from Uvalde aloud there, and we even watched some people wipe away tears in the gallery there on the second level of the Senate chamber. But let's talk about legislation here. What did state lawmakers do? over the last 135 days, over the last 365 days since the shooting happened. Well, the bill that would have required armed guards at every school campus across the state, that one was gutted. Raising the age limit from 18 to 21 to buy certain semi-automatic rifles did not get very far. State Senator Roland Gutierrez represents Uvalde. He's been out front on trying to get something passed ever since this happened one year ago. And he shared something with me in his office, a call he got from Uvalde family members after that school shooting happened in Nashville back in March. After the Tennessee event, I had a couple of them call me up crying. They felt guilty that they had not done enough. Imagine that. After the shooting in Nashville, at that Covenant After the school. shooting at a little school that killed little kids in Nashville, I have parents from Uvalde that lost children crying to me, feeling guilty that they had not done enough. Don't expect any gun restrictions. This is Texas. Republicans run Texas. There's just not political appetite for anything like that to happen. There are four and a half more days, though, left in the legislative session. We will be watching to see what, if anything, comes out of it. Back to you guys. Yeah, and Jason, uh, now whether the state funds it or not, Texas already has a program that allows teachers to buy guns. Yeah, the school marshal program was created after the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary on December 14th of 2012. 11 years later, 74 school districts participate in the program, but only 306 people are licensed to be a school marshal. And as Matt Howerton shows us, that's not all school districts are doing to protect our children. Students at Woodrow Wilson High in Dallas leave for the day like any other. They don't need to bring a gun to school. But Wednesday morning, anything but routine. I mean, even at being in the parking lot is still too close. Dallas ISD police arrested a student with a gun in the parking lot before classes began. The gun never made it inside, and officials believe the teen never intended to use it, but... The fact this happened on the one-year anniversary of the Uvalde mass shooting doesn't make this easier to digest. The district did say the gun wouldn't have been found if it weren't for a vigilant staffer. That vigilance, sadly, sharpened by tragedy. 
Dallas ISD, one of many districts in Texas that's been on its toes since Uvalde. This school year, it did away with backpacks that aren't clear or mesh for middle and high schoolers. To make sure that we are staying abreast and ahead of school safety. DeSoto ISD banned backpacks for the remainder of the school year for middle and high school students. Thinking outside of the box, Pilot Point ISD showed us its new emergency evacuation system that uses light sensors to show students where a shooter is and where it's safe to run to. That's the world we live in, unfortunately, and we've got to do it. Other districts like Plano ISD are fortifying where children learn. Elementary schools in the district will be fitted with a secure door and all windows will have entry resistant film in the summer. Allowing teachers and staff who are trained in firearm safety is a common sense solution. And WFAA was there when Keller ISD board members made a controversial vote that allows teachers and staff to conceal carry on campus. We still have a long way to go. School security consultant and former DISD police chief Craig Miller has been busy assisting districts statewide since Uvalde. What we have to do is we really need to work on changing the culture at schools. A culture Miller says where safety comes first. In Dallas, I'm Matt Howerton. The conversation about school safety and gun violence isn't a new one. We've been talking about this for decades. At least since 1999 in Columbine. You remember the entire nation was shocked when two high school students killed 12 classmates and one teacher in Littleton, Colorado. And WFAA held a town hall after that shooting to talk about guns. And here we are, still debating it 24 years later. Here's more from Jobin Paniker. I'm in a pretzel. What are you, a dog? Yeah. Okay. Life is a lot like working our way around the game board. Here's some handies. Landing on the spaces that matter. Stop here, very warriors. Go warriors. In this building, in this room. You may remember. 24 years ago. A family first special WFAA did after the mass shooting at Columbine High School. Death and signs that help me, I'm bleeding to death. Students and a media tech. I sound so young. <laughs> <laughs> and John Matthews is a school safety expert. My first and, reaction uh, is I wish I had the dark hair again. And if I had one word for the parents, it'd be perseverance. We I, featured I, I, John Matthews, a crime and school safety expert, still out. is. I like the all the new rules and stuff. Situation. I didn't at first, but yeah. now that I think about it. And Erica Wise, uh, then Erica Dunkley, who was a senior and student journalist at the time. Tornado and fire drill. And that's it. <laughs> no active shooter drills. No, that wasn't even a, a term. <laughs> Prior to Columbine, we had never heard of active shooter. And unfortunately, active shooter is part of our vernacular now. In light of what's happened, say, in Colorado last week, 800 perhaps miles from Columbine. 1,200 people joined us here in the cafeteria. South Grand Prairie High School held a parent-student town hall. People that wanted to be here and offer up their thoughts and opinions. Young people given cover by SWAT team members. What happened at Columbine shattered the collective conscious. This is insane. This will never happen again. I never thought it would happen again. Mass shootings didn't just happen again, but again and again and again. There's so much more now, and it's just, it's like whack-a-mole. We counted 118 school mass shootings alone since 1999. I literally never would have thought that 24 years later, I'd be doing this same interview. Never. Fitting in, being popular, those were both ingredients that caused the combustion in Colorado. It's like we're stuck on one space of the game board. SROs, we were talking about backpacks, we were talking about metal detectors. 24 years later, we're still debating those things. John says law enforcement has gotten better in its response to active shooters. The training has helped. We've got to constantly evolve because the shooter's evolving. Anybody see Lord Cruelty? We have yet to pull a card that solves our mass shooting problem. Hey, look. Erica is now married. Thank you found a home in Arlington, and a good long career in real estate. I get calls constantly. John writes and consults on mass shootings now more than ever. The rest of the time. You can smell the flowers, the roses. Is spent with family in his winery and vineyard. Yeah, that's what it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's a total juxtaposition to the rest of my life. It really is kind of my therapy. South Grand Prairie High School has now double doors with controlled access. I think it's gonna help us all to grow as a school and individually. It's cool to see my, me and my friends, our reaction when it happened 24 years later, you know? I don't know, it was, I guess it was just emotional. We are all living life 
rolling the dice. Here's to hoping well, I called to school. we well, start making the right help. moves. Uh, but you got to persevere. How can you retire if you think you can help and you can save lives? In DFW. I don't know. I'm Jobin Puniker. How do we prevent the next mass shooting before it happens? Is there a direct link between mass shootings and mental illness? So, you know, it's complicated. Some say the first step is recognizing the signs, and it starts with mental health. The Allen Mall shooter was discharged from the Army over mental health concerns, and several people who knew the Uvalde shooter considered him unstable. Teresa Woodard takes a closer look at what role mental health plays in these mass shootings and whether Texas is doing enough to address it. Every time it happens. The long-term solution here uh, is to address the mental health issue. We hear it. And those with serious mental illness. So? Is there a direct link between mass shootings and mental illness? So, you know, it's complicated. We asked experts. There's no relationship between mental illness as a group and mass shootings at all whether it's in schools or otherwise. And that's a really important thing because there's a huge societal bias that says people with mental illness are violent. Research shows people with severe mental illness are at slightly higher risk of becoming violent compared to people without. So that means if we have 100 people in a room who are not seriously mentally ill, mentally Ill two of them will be violent. And if we have 100 people with serious mental illness in the room, three of them will be violent. It is oversimplifying a complex issue to call mental health the only problem. But lack of access to mental health care is a huge problem. Our uh, mental health system is in a state of crisis, especially when it comes to its workforce. They say Texas needs more mental health workers, a lot more, and needs to pay them more, a lot more. That's something urgent that the state is not doing, but it has started doing other things. After Santa Fe, a telemedicine program launched to identify students in need of care. The state is adding inpatient psychiatric beds and more intense therapy programs. We have lacked all of this for years, so it should make a difference, but... These types of huge changes take time. Not an immediate difference. And that's difficult knowing it could happen again. In Dallas, I'm Teresa Woodard. From Columbine to Uvalde and now Allen, it is evident we still have a long way to go. Something needs to change. If not for you, then the innocent people who continue to lose their lives. We leave you tonight with a reminder of what we lost in Uvalde. It has been one year since we lost them. 365 days since 19 children and two teachers went to school on a Tuesday like any other and never came home. Crosses were built, murals painted, balloons released, honoring who they were, mourning who they could have become. They had dreams. Jackie Caceres wanted to be a veterinarian, Jose Flores Jr. wanted to be a police officer, and Alethea Ramirez wanted to be an artist. She was an artist. The people who knew and loved these faces cling to what they have of them. They share old photos and videos. I love you so much, and you can send me a video too. I'll be happy. They remember little things. Eliana Garcia's family called her Ellie for short. She loved Encanto and played basketball. Eliana Torres was an athlete too. She died just days before her last softball game of the season, so local teams honored her by playing the games she loved, wearing jerseys with her picture on them. The murals painted by various artists honor each victim, telling their stories, sharing their hearts with those who see them. Xavier Lopez's family wanted to make sure his mural included the teddy bear that he loved to have on all of his shirts. And cousins Jayla Silguero and Jace Luevenos's family made sure his mural included a dinosaur and hers had a unicorn. They were so young. Most should have turned 11 this year. Usia Garcia's favorite character was Spider-Man and Rogelio Torres loved Pikachu. They were young. 
but they have legacies that will live on. You as leaders have a choice of what my daughter's life will be remembered for. Will she die in vain or will her life have saved another child? Tess Mattis' parents created a scholarship for students in Texas State University's College of Health Professions to honor her dreams. And Girl Scouts of America awarded Amory Jo Garza the rare bronze cross for her bravery. If you haven't said happy Mother's Day to your mom, what are you doing? Go say it right now. States away. The Detroit Youth Choir sings the song Layla Salazar would sing with her father on the way to school in the morning. Can you show these shoes, please? And many bought green Converse sneakers, drawing a heart on the right toe just like Mate Rodriguez was wearing that day. These are the same green Converse on her feet that turned out to be the only clear evidence that could identify her after the shooting. Annabelle Rodriguez loved blue butterflies, and Miranda Mathis had a thing for purple unicorns that McKenna Elrod named all of the animals her parents showed at the local stock show, and that Navai Bravo created beautiful doodles of birds and hearts. They were children. And the two teachers who died trying to protect their students had children of their own. Eva Mariles was honored by her fitness community with a special workout and a race. And Irma Garcia was laid to rest with her husband and high school sweetheart who passed just days later from a heart attack. But his loved one says he just couldn't take life without her. Our world lost these beautiful people one year ago. But the people who knew and loved them will make sure no amount of time makes us forget. <laughs>